Praise God. Hallelujah. Turn me if we to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. This is a great time of the year. How many of you know that? This is a great time of the year. This is a time when the whole world gets to recognize. I don't mean just a, you know, like Thanksgiving. It's a United States thing, right? You go down to the Caribbean, they're not celebrating uh, Thanksgiving because after all, uh, we're celebrating Thanksgiving because what happened in our country. But how many of you know Christmas is celebrated all over the world? All over the world. Korea, Japan, China, every place there's a Christian, they're going to recognize, they're going to recognize the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Caribbean celebrates it, decorate, and they put things all up, and they make sure uh, that Christmas is an important time. Is anybody with me? You see, uh, the Bible tells us some important things about Christmas. I wish I could get into them all this morning, but I can't. The Bible says uh, at Christmas time when Jesus came, the Prince of Peace came to us. He's the Prince of Peace. Do you want peace? You want peace in your life? How I many of you know there's turmoil and there's fear in our world today? Fear and turmoil and people are not sure what the answer is and not sure what's going on. The, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When you know him, it doesn't matter what's going on. When you know him, it doesn't matter if the world comes to the end. If you know him as Lord and Master and King, there'll always be a comfort in your heart in the midst of the turmoil. And then Emmanuel. Emmanuel, I'm going to take a little bit from David Jeremiah this morning. Emmanuel, he preached on the, on the subject, God with us. God with us. Think about that, God with us. Think about how mighty it is for God. To, God left his throne in heaven. God sent his son because he loved us so much. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God loved you and me so much that he looked down over the balconies of heaven. He looked down over the banister. He looked down over his creation of man, and he said, they're messed up. He said, they're confused. They don't know what direction they're going. But I love them so much, I'm going to send my son to leave the corridors of heaven and go down to earth. He's the son of God, but now he's going to be the son of man and dwell with people so they can get straightened out and they can have a savior and they can have direction and they can have a word to live by. That's how much God loved you. God with us. God became flesh. God, the creator of the universe, became flesh through the person of Jesus Christ. To give us life and give it to us abundantly. I think he looked down over the corridors of heaven and he said, that old devil, he's still trying to do his nasty stuff. I think he looked down over the banister and he said, that devil is, to, is distorting a lot of people's minds and putting confusion and, and, and destroying them because the scripture says that the, the thief comes with to steal and destroy and to kill. But Jesus came to give life and give it to us abundantly. Are you with me? Then another Christmas thing that we understand is he's the everlasting father. Everlasting. He was there in the beginning. He's there in the ending. He's the creator of all things. There's nothing that he doesn't know. There isn't anything that he's not aware of. There isn't a heartache or a heartbreak or a circumstance that you're going through that God doesn't know about it. He is the I am that I am. You know what that means? He told Moses, he said, when you go before Pharaoh, you tell him, I am that I am sent you. That means I am the God in the beginning and I am the God at the end and I'm the God in between. Anybody with me? Everlasting, everlasting. He was there before there was anything or anyone else and he's going to be there when everything all finishes and comes together and he's going to be here for us all the way through the things that we need. He's the everlasting father. And then he's called the ancient of days. Anybody ever hear that phrase? Ancient, ancient. That means he was beyond and further back. All the scientists will tell you how many million years the world's existed and, and they dig up old bones and they say how many millions of years it is and then they do a carbon-14 test and they try to prove how many millions of years. I got news for you. The Ancient of Days was there before the millions. Is anybody with me? Before anything was, he was. Because he says, I am that I am. And he is king of kings and he's the Lord of lords and he's our savior. 
And when I think about Christmas, I think of all these things. And don't, don't get me wrong. I, I think the decorations are okay and the Christmas tree is okay. I could preach a sermon on that Christmas tree right there. Preach a sermon using every light that's on there and preach a sermon that would, that would magnify and lift up Jesus. We could say all the white lights is royalty and they're purity. The red represents the blood of Jesus. Is anybody with me? All the colors on the tree represent uh, that, he, uh, that Jesus came to save the red and yellow, black and white, and we're all precious in his sight. Just look around a little bit, and God will put a sermon in your heart. Amen? So Christmas is, is about who he is. And don't get caught up in all the wonder of the giftings and all the, of the gifts and all the wonder of, the, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the, the stuff that's going to be bought and all the wonder of commercialism. Don't get caught up in that. It's okay. It's okay to buy gifts. That's a great thing to do and exchange gifts and say, I love you because Jesus uh, paid the price for us and so I can extend uh, my extension of love to you. But the greatest gift is who Jesus is. He was the greatest gift of all. Don't miss that one. In the midst of all your gifts, don't miss the greatest gift. Amen? If somebody goes through Christmas and they're lost at the other end, they miss the very purpose of what Christmas is all about. Jesus didn't come as a little baby, and you know, people look at little baby Jesus and say, oh, how cute. It's okay to say how cute. Uh, David Jeremiah said that this morning, so I'm just repeating what he said. He said, he said you, did, was you, did you hear him this morning? Oh, sad. Oh, oh I feel bad that you didn't. <clears throat> And, he, and, and David Jeremiah said that everybody says, how cute the baby. And how many of you know babies are cute? How many of you think, listen, how many of you here are parents or grandparents? How many of you thought when your baby was born or your grandbaby was born, it had to be the cutest, the prettiest, the loveliest baby that was ever put on the face of the earth? How many of you think that? Okay, now I want you to just raise your hand to look at somebody else that raised their hand and say this. You thought your baby was cute. You ought to have seen mine. <laughs> you see, babies are cute, but let me say this about cute baby Jesus. Baby Jesus, the, the purpose of baby Jesus wasn't to be a little baby and how cute. God had to bring him into this earth born born into a human body so he could recognize and he could be the son of man and he could understand every heartache that you go through and he could understand every hurt. And the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He didn't come to be a little baby in a manger and be treated and, and be pampered all the way through his life like a lot of children are, amen? He came, he came into this world to suffer. He came in this world to die. He came into this world as a baby so he can touch our lives in every single way. The Christmas season is on, upon us and the next few times when I have a chance to minister, it's probably going to be around the story. But I want to talk about two people that really impresses me. And I'm going to title this message, Impossible Things Do Happen. I said impossible things do happen. He's still the God of the impossible today. I'm going to take you through just one chapter in chapter one of the book of Luke so you can turn there. And I'm going to look at two people that in the natural, these things should have happened, but impossible things do happen. Would you all remember that phrase this morning? So when you think you're at the end of your rope and you think that nobody cares... And you think it's more than you can bear. Remember this. Impossible things still happen. God still raises people up off of beds that man has given up on. God is still doing miracles in people's lives today. How many of you right here, how many of you in your Christian life, you can remember at least one time that a true miracle took place in your life? Look at the hands. Look, you think miracles aren't still in operation today? Keep your hands up. Everybody, hand, raise your hand. I want everybody else to look around. We still live in a day of miracles. We still live in a day of miracles. 
I say, God still performs miracles today. Hallelujah. Looking at Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, there was in the day of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. Now, the division of Abijah, by the way, Abijah had the seventh division. In Israel, over in the Pentateuch, how many of you know what the Pentateuch is? Oh, man, we need to, Dr. Seymour, we need to do some Old Testament surveys teaching right here. The Pentateuch, somebody say Penta. Penta means five sides. Am I right? The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's called the Pentateuch. And most all the Old Testament people, the, the, the Old Testament was still being written, so most of them lived by the Pentateuch. Are you with me? And in Leviticus, it talks about the different tribes of Israel that were broken down out of the Levite tribe, out of the Levites. How many of you know the Levites were the priests? The Levites were chosen and separated. How many of you know when, uh, when uh, God took the children of Israel by the leadership of Joshua into the promised land, into Canaan, how many of you know that all the 11 tribes were given different sections of property and claimed it as their own, except Levi? How many of you, Levi was one of the sons and Levi was one of the tribes? Are you with me? Levi was not given a plot of land because they were the priestly tribe. They were the ones in charge of the tabernacle. They were the ones where all the singers came from. They were the ones where the musicians came from. Uh, all of them were keepers of the house. Some may say keepers of the house. The Levites were the keepers of the house, and God did not give them a piece of property and houses that they didn't build and, 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 and uh, 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 vineyards that they didn't plant. Is anybody with me? Why didn't he give them then? Because the other 11 tribes were supposed to take care of the priestly tribe. Is anybody with me? See, that's the reason it's so important for us to give tithes and offerings today because we need to make sure that we take care of the anointed and appointed ones of God so they can do the work of the, of the ministry. Is anybody with me so far? Well, Zechariah was a Levite, and he was a priest, and he was out of the seventh order. The seventh order, you can read this over in Leviticus, uh, or not Leviticus, probably in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 24 and verse 6 through 9, you'll find out uh, where the order, the order was given to uh, Abijah as one of the priests that collected the priests that were going to assign service in the temple. Now, Zechariah was part of that order. And his wife was the daughters of Aaron. Is anybody with me on this? I'm still in verse 5. And his wife was the daughters of Aaron. How many of you know who, if I say, if I talk about Aaron, how many of you know who Aaron is? Aaron was one of the priests selected to walk with Moses to bring the children of Israel out and guide them, direct them in ministry. Am I right? Aaron, the priest. Let me say Aaron, the priest. But listen to this. If his wife was Elizabeth, was after the order or in the, in the household of Aaron, a daughter of Aaron, and, and by the way, Aaron's wife was called Elizabeth too. So she was named after Aaron's wife, Elizabeth, and her name was Elizabeth. And both of these priests were righteous. Now, that's a pretty good connection, a priestly woman and a priestly man uh, that's been selected to walk in the priesthood of taking all the sins of the Israelites into the Holy of Holies and to be able to move them up for a year and intercede for God's people. How many of you know that's an honorable and a respected and a high position? Do we have the picture of that, that priest? If, if it's easy to put up, put it up. If it's not, don't worry about it. These priests had to go through a whole lot to get where they could look like this. They had to wear the certain garments. And they had to put the breastplate. Uh, the, all these different things that are on the front of the breastplate were named and appointed for different reasons. They couldn't go into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God just sashaying in there like it didn't matter. 
Now, they didn't go in the presence of God like they're going to go to a golf game after they're done. Uh, they didn't go in there. Uh, they went in there prepared and ready uh, with, uh, with white linen garments that didn't m make sweat. Uh, with the proper attire that was de designated to them uh, in the word of God. Why? Because they was going into the presence of God and they was representing God's people. Somebody with me. This is how uh, Zechariah went into the Holy of Holies. And they were both righteous. They were both righteous. How many of you know if you're going to represent God, you should be a righteous person? I like what it says in, in James chapter 5, that effectual fervent prayer of righteous men availeth much. Is anybody with me? And so we need to understand that we need to be a righteous people in God's presence. How many of you know you don't need the high priest to be dressed up in the priestly garbs to go into the presence of God in your behalf today? How many of you know you don't need that? Well, Pastor, I just soon tell you my problems and you can take it before God. How many of you know you don't need to do that? Because when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and, and, and the veil was rent from top to bottom in the, in, in the same tabernacle that's in the heavenlies, the veil was rent from top to bottom. And we're told now by the Hebrew writer we can come boldly, boldly into the throne of grace to find mercy in times of need. Has anybody here besides me and Mr. Howard, has anybody beside me and Mr. Howard ever had to go boldly into the throne of grace and find some mercy, say, God, it's me again, Lord. I, I, I need mercy today. I need mercy today. Uh, Lord, some things happened today. I didn't think right. I didn't say the right thing. I didn't do the right thing. But, oh, God, thank you for your mercy. I'm coming boldly into your throne room to find mercy in times. Anybody else other than me and Mr. Howard? And, and Brother Anson. I'm sure Brother Anson's had to find mercy. And John. And Kenny. You see, we can come boldly in the throne room of God and find mercy. But, they, but it says, and they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord. Listen, they had to be some extraordinary people. Elizabeth and Zechariah had to be incredible. Why is that? Because it said that they walked in all the commandments. How many of you think that's pretty heavy? They, not one, not a few. They walked in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. That's heavy duty. I don't know about you, but I mean, that's, that's not Jesus, but that's close. Right? I mean, they had to be, they, they had to be tuned in. They had to be knowing who God is. They were both priests. They had to know the Old Testament. They had to know the Pentateuch. They had to understand the scriptures. They probably knew and memorized the book of Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah 53. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes uh, we are here. They had to know uh, what was coming. It hadn't happened yet, but they knew it was coming. And both, but they had no children. Now, that don't mean too much to us today. A couple gets married. Uh, they're married for years. They don't have any children. Uh, they're getting to the age where they can't have children. Maybe they adopt a, a child or maybe they have adopted a child previously. And, and we go happy and we raise our children. Uh, those children we adopted, they're ours now because we've raised them. Amen? Is anybody with me? But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both advanced in years. Let me explain this to you. First of all, back in these days, back in Bible days, when a woman wasn't able to have a child, it was considered a curse from God on them. If a woman couldn't have a child and give her husband a child, then it was considered there was something wrong. And, and after years go by, people start to think there must be some secret sin in their life. Must be something there. I mean, after all, you know, like Job's friends, how they accuse Job's of everything because after all, Job, if, if you was a righteous man, this wouldn't happen to you. So uh, I, I know you haven't advertised your sin, but something's going on. Anybody with me? And so uh, the... the uh, disgrace that Elizabeth took on herself because she was barren and couldn't have a child 
And yet, you know what's interesting about Elizabeth? In the midst of being accused of having sin in her life, in, a, in the midst of feeling uh, left out by God, in the, in, in the midst of feeling maybe where's my blessing for a child, she never backed away from God. She never said, God, how come? She never said, God, I think I'll, I'll, I'll quit serving you. She, she, she didn't ever do, well, how do we know that? Because she was righteous and she walked in the commandments of God and the ordinances of God and she was blameless. So it was that, so it was in verse eight uh, that while he, this is Zechariah, uh, was serving as priest before God in the order of his division. Somebody tell me what his division was. The seventh division, right? I told you that, seven. You'll have to go over to First Chronicles and find that. But he was in the seventh division. So when the seventh division was chosen to go and serve, and let me tell you that there was 2,000 priests at this time in the area of Israel and Jerusalem. 2,000 priests served in the temple. And many of them had an attitude that I'm the priest. They cared about themselves. They fleeced the sheep. They took advantage of people. But I think there was at least two righteous ones, Zachariah and Elizabeth. And I don't think if Elizabeth went around saying, I'm as good as my husband, I'm a priest too, I'm from the order of, uh, I'm from the order of, uh, of Aaron, I don't think she said that. I think she was a submitted woman to her husband. I think she understood uh, what uh, Ephesians chapter 5 uh, and verse 22 says, even though it wasn't written down, I think she understood, uh, wives, submit yourself to your husband. Husbands, love your wife as Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her. She was a submitted woman. Why? Because she kept the ordinances and the commandments of God, and that's part of the commandments and the ordinances. Am I right? But she was barren, and probably the first time in, in his life they was past the years of, uh, of childbearing. And to be selected as a priest, they usually selected the, the, the priest over 60 years old, according to historians. So they were over 60 years old. He was selected probably for the first time in his life to stand in behalf of the, of the children of Israel. He was... He was given the opportunity to put the priestly robes on and prepare himself and pray and seek God and go in the presence of God to move the sins up for a year because remember, that was on the other side of the cross still. How many of you know what I'm saying if I say this was on the other side of the cross? This was on the other side. You see, if it was on this side of the cross, the blood would have been shed, the body would have been broken, the resurrection would have taken place, and they would have lived on the, side of, uh, on the victory side of the cross. But this was still on the other side. The children of Israel couldn't just pray and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. They had to go to the priest, and they had to buy animal sacrifices, and they had to go to the brazen altar, and they had to go through the holy place, uh, the, the holy place. They had to go past the table of showbread, and they had to go past, past the the uh, altar of incense and when they went to the altar of incense it was at the opening door of the holy of holies inside the holy of holies it was the ark of the covenant the glory the power the presence of the lord and his the priest's first job was to go and burn incense on the incense altar and when he would burn incense on the incense altar, uh, the, uh, the incense would go up, the smoke would go up into the throne room of God and it would be a sweet, sweet fragrance to God. And then he would go into the Holy of Holies and they would tie, uh, they would tie a rope around his ankle. And he would have the robe on. If you, would, if you could see the bottom of that robe, it would have bells and pomegranates all around the bottom. So as he would walk, you could hear the bells uh, ringing. You could hear the pomegranates hitting the bells, and they could hear him going into the Holy of Holies. And the reason why the rope was tied there is there was sin in his life. If God didn't accept the priests bringing the sin sacrifices in, if he did something wrong in the process, he would be, strict, he, he would be struck dead in the Holy of Holies. And they would take the rope and pull him out. Nobody would dare to go in there. Is anybody with me? That still happened right before Jesus was born. And so Zechariah had the privilege of going in there. And he went in the Holy of Holies to serve. In verse 9, according to the customs of, his, of the priesthood, his lot fell. 
to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. They were all praying and say, Lord, don't strike him dead. Lord, let the priest, this is his first time in his lifetime that he's got to do this. He was chosen to do this honorable thing, to take our sins in. Oh, God, they were praying for him. They knew how serious the presence of God. They knew how powerful the glory of God. They knew how powerful God's presence and glory and honor was. And they knew the priest was going to go into the temple of God. And he went into the temple of the Lord, it says in verse 9. Verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. As he, was, he wasn't in the Holy of Holies yet. He wasn't, in, he wasn't standing in front of the mercy seat. He wasn't standing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. He was standing in the doorway uh, where the altar of incense is. He was burning incense on behalf of all the people, and an angel appeared. We take that lightly today. We take it as, you know, that never happens. I could walk you through Scripture time and time again where angels appeared and spoke, not just to Mary, but to Zechariah and all through Scripture. I tell you where angels spoke to Apostle Paul when he was out, he, he was out on a ship during that great storm of Rockledon, and, and angels spoke all the way through. We find the angels of God were appearing and messengers of God speaking to people. I believe when God spoke to me for the vision for this church, the angel of the Lord spoke to me because God uses angels as messengers. Is anybody with me? And when Zechariah saw the angel in verse 12, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Church, let me tell you, when we get into the presence of God, there ought to be a, not afraid to the, to the fact that we, uh, we're so fearful we, uh, we don't want God around, but there ought, to be a, 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 there ought to be an attitude of awe that we are in the presence of the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're in the presence of the creator of the universe. We're in the presence of almighty God. All he has to do is just breathe, and, I, and, and, and we could be disintegrated. Amen? If he wanted to, because he's God. But he loves us so much that he will speak to us in our time of need. And fear fell upon him. And verse 13 says, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Aren't you glad that God always has a comforting side? It'll always settle you down. When you're going through your deepest hour, if you'll listen, God will settle you down. When you think there's no way out, God will show you a way out. When you think that, uh, the, that the wall's too high, you can't go over and you can't go under and it's too far to the right and too far to the left, God will make a way when there is no way. Because he loves you and he wants to say, fear not, my child, I've got my hand upon you. Fear not, my son, my daughter, I'm there. Fear not, we're going we're gonna to make it through because... I've got an answer for you. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for the prayers is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Call his name John. Probably need to understand this, that the word Zechariah, first of all, means the Lord remembers. If you look up the word Zechariah, the, 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 the name means the Lord remembers. That means if God remembers, he might not be there when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. That means when you cry out for God at 30 years old saying, I'm a barren woman, i got to have a child. If God remembers and you're 70, he's going to give you that child. That's just how good God is. And then the Elizabeth's name, by the way, if you want to know what Elizabeth means, it means the oath of God. God remembers and the oath of God. Here's two people living together that God remembers and God keeps his promises. To me, an oath is if an oath of God means the promises of God and God keeps them. When God makes a commitment, he's going to see it through. He doesn't forget. He knows your needs. Amen. And I believe Elizabeth probably cried out for years and years and years, God, why am I barren? Why am I don't have a child? And here's the reason. Because God had her in a holding pattern. God had her circling, circling the airport. 
he didn't open up the runway for her to land to have that child because there was a certain special moment that was going to take place because she was going to usher in a son named John that was going to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, uh, that, uh, that his latches, his, 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 the shoes of Jesus, he couldn't even unlatch. And he said, he said, I'm going to decrease and he's going to increase. And John's very purpose in life uh, was to be the forerunner for Jesus Christ. How many of you think that's great timing? You see, they didn't understand it, but God had something special for her. Verse 11, 14 says, And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. You see, John had to come first before Jesus. If he was the forerunner, then he had to come before Jesus. Is anybody with me? He had to make preparation. John the Baptist spent 30 years on the backside of the desert doing nothing but preparing himself for a short-lived ministry, and that was to come out when Jesus came and prepare the way of the Lord. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, in verse 15, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink because he was a Nazarite. If you read the, the requirements of a Nazarite, now these are the Nazarite rules. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. How many of you know that was true? How many of you remember when Mary uh, was pregnant with Jesus and she went to Elizabeth's house and when she walked in the door, uh, Elizabeth said, I felt him jump. I felt John leap within me because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. How many of you believe God is still the God of impossible things? I'm talking to you about impossible things this morning. Impossible things do happen. God can bring a, a, a child into a woman that's beyond the age of childbearing. God can anoint a man and, 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 and speak through him and, and prophesy the things that's going to come to pass. God can bring a child that's going to make the difference to the world. And God can do impossible things in your life too. Verse 16 says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord our God. We know that's been prophesied over in Malachi in the last chapter. The hearts of the fathers will be restored to the hearts of the children. He will also go before him in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and his disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall this how shall I know this? That cost him something, that statement right there. Zechariah paid the price for that statement. That very statement. You need, if you don't have anything underlined in this chapter, underline that. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am old. I'm an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Why? Because you did not believe me. You didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. You see, we've got to be careful how we respond to God. We've got to be careful how we think when God speaks. We've got to be careful we don't flippantly say something off the, uh, the side of order just because it came, it came buzzing through our brain, so we just blurted it out. Has anybody ever blurted something out when you said, oh, man, I never should have said that? Has anybody ever opened mouth, insert foot, say something at the wrong time? Mickey has a saying, still tongue makes wise woman. Still tongue makes wise man. Amen. And in closing in verse 21, and the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were complete that he departed and he went to his house. Miracles still happen today, church. 
If you want to read about miracles, just go and open up this, uh, the, the Gospel of Luke or the, any of the four Gospels and find out that miracles happen and miracles will still happen today. What about you? How many of you are needing a miracle in your life? How many of you right here need a miracle in your life? Miracles still happen. I'm going to believe everybody raise your hand for your miracle. Can I do that? In fact, would you raise your hand right now? I'm going to pray with you this very moment before we do anything else. Father, if you brought a miracle to Zachariah and you brought a miracle to Elizabeth and you brought John the Baptist into the world beyond the age of childbearing in Elizabeth, and you was able to cause Zachariah's tongue to cleave to the top of his mouth for nine months. And he couldn't speak and he had to write everything down. Because he was bringing forth the one that was going to be the forerunner of your son Jesus. If you can do that, Lord, you can do the miracles. Every hand that's up right now, I pray over them. God, I ask in Jesus' name, that, Lord, that you perform the miracle in their lives right now. Lord, some of them are praying for loved ones that are lost. Some of them are praying for healing in their bodies. Some of them, God, have been crying out for a long time, saying, Lord, heal me. This, this pain that sometimes gets, gets the next to me. Heal, heal me, Lord. And maybe we haven't seen it yet, but God, we know one thing. You're a miracle-working God. And Lord, Elizabeth cried out for years and years for this child, and she didn't see it yet. But when the time came, the miracle came. And Lord, I agree with every person that's got their hand up for their miracle in Jesus' name. Not by might, it's not by power, but it's by thy spirit, saith the Lord. So, Lord, I claim the healing. I claim the miracle. I claim the loved one to be saved. I claim the victory right now in Jesus' name. Every person who got your hands up, I want you to say, I consider it done. Say, I can, say my miracle's on the way. Say that. My miracle's on the way. My miracle's on the way. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap. Glory. I went a little bit long. I appreciate your patience. We don't have a service tonight. So I want to take liberty to say this. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, I'd like to believe every single person in the sound of my voice, you know, Jesus, you're saved. Had a personal relationship with him, but maybe you don't. Would you give this pastor the privilege to pray for you? Pastor, how do I know that I'm saved? By answering this question. If you would die tonight, God forbid, but if you would die tonight, do you know your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know you got a home in heaven? Do you know you're going to spend eternity with Him? If you're not positive about that, then would you give this pastor the privilege to pray for you? Pastor, we can't know that till we get to heaven. Jesus said, these things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternity. Maybe you're here and you used to serve God. You used to be strong in the things of God, but the cares of the world, sickness, pain, being offended, got wounded, all crept into your life, and the luster and the shine for God's gone. I hear him speaking to somebody right now saying, it's time to come home. It's time to come back. It's time to let me put my big arms around you and love you. Who cares that somebody offended you? Who cares if somebody hurts you? If it wouldn't be them, somebody else probably would. But Jesus is saying this, I'm a friend that sticks close to the brother. Jesus is saying this to you, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. If you meet either one of those categories and you would allow this pastor to pray for you, would you raise your hand right now and say, that's me. God bless you, God bless you, dear. God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. Somebody else, God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand. God bless you, brother. Raise your hand right now because I'm going to pray for you. You meet either one of them categories. You're not positive you're saved or you've found yourself in a condition where you've lost the luster of the shyness of God and you want it back. Raise your hand. Everybody that raised your hand, raise it again one more time. Raise your hand again. You just raise your hand. Raise it again. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Stand with me, please. Everybody in the house. Those of that raised your hand as the elders are coming to this altar, I want you to step out of that aisle. Meet me right here. Meet me right here because I'm going to pray for you. Every person raises their hand. Meet me right here, right now. Don't let the devil cheat you out of this. This is the, this is the most exciting time in your life.
come close to me. Don't worry about anybody else. Just come in here tight. God bless you. God bless you, sister. Bless you, my brother. Amen. We want, we want God to change our life, right? We're ready. The Spirit of the Lord's all over this sweet sister right here. I want to be able to get close so I can pray with you. Come, come, come. Amen. Come on, brother. Come in here close. Get in tight. I'm going to ask every one of you to, to pray with me this morning. This is a monumental moment. This is when the Holy Ghost has reached out and touched some hearts. How many of you can see that? And I want them to feel the love of this church. I don't want any of them to get away from us this morning without somebody loving them and saying, I can help you grow. I'm going to stand with you. What can I do to help you stay close to God? Pray this prayer with me. I want everybody here to pray. Say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for touching me this morning. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and make me whole. I confess Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. And I acknowledge that God raised Christ from the dead. Lord, according to your word, I am saved. I have a home in heaven. My name's written in the book. And Lord, I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, give a praise for these wonderful people. I'm going to pray over them right now. So just stand here with me, Father. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Baptize my sister in the power of the Holy Spirit. Empower her, to, Lord, to live and to walk and to be strong in this commitment that she made. Baptize my brother in the Holy Spirit with power and with the anointing, Jesus. You're the baptizer. Baptize my sister in the power of the Holy Spirit with your anointing and with your presence, Lord. Baptize my brother in the Holy Ghost this morning that he'll have power to live this thing, not on his own strength, but, Lord, by your strength and your might. Lord, baptize my brother in the Holy Spirit, anoint him with power and bring him to that place, God, where he puts his dependency on you. Fill my brother with the Holy Ghost and with power and with the anointing. The Lord, he can live for you every day. God will give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to go. I mean, go with them for a minute. You can go. Go with your friends. Anybody who's got friends, go with them. Encourage them. You'll be back in five minutes. Amen. Lord, Praise God, we threw the net, church. And God brought in the harvest. Can somebody say amen? We'll be dismissed in a moment or two, but if you have need, come. We're here to pray for you. If you, have, if you need a healing in your body, come. If you need a touch from God, come. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living saint. Sanctuary for you. Oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Sanctuary. May everybody sing that with me as a preparation for our heart. Pure and holy. Oh, tried and true. And with Thanksgiving, oh, I'll, I'll be, be a living, living. oh, sanctuary for you. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. You have a neat come. We're going to be dismissed right after this song. Tried and Tried and true. With Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for. Have you received the word this morning? Have you? God is the God impossible. Impossible things still happen. 
And I'm believing that every hand was raised and we prayed together that the impossible thing happened to you this morning. We all agree with that? You all agree with me? Don't forget to come tonight. Listen, a lot of work was done, a lot of preparation. If someone spends all that time in preparation, the guests ought to show up. Amen. It's a time for us to celebrate our Christmas together. Sometimes people say, well, why don't we have a Christmas party? We're having one. Having one tonight in the Family Life Center just for you. And every one of you is our honored guest. So come. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your presence this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the harvest. Souls that were touched. Lives that said, I want to follow Jesus. They prayed that sinner's prayer. Their name is in your book. And they have a home for eternity in heaven. Because, Jesus, you came to the earth. Because God with us is still with us and still dealing with us and still touching us. We thank you for it, Lord. We ask you to bless each and every person in this house. Bless them this afternoon. Let some folks get a good rest. And have a good meal. And spend time with people that they love. And Lord, come back tonight to enjoy some good music and fellowship and sharing with each other and feeling their hearts, Lord God, with the spirit of Christmas. Christ Mass. That's what Christmas is. Christ Mass. A mass of people gathering unto Christ. That's what Christmas means. So we're going to have Christmas tonight. A mass of people gathering unto Christ. Lord, we thank you for it. We give you praise. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, turn around and tell somebody you love them before you leave this place.